It's my pleasure to welcome you to another one of our videos in this series of interviews with the editors from our journal Chemical Engineering Research and Design. Uh, today, we're covering some new ground. Uh, we're interviewing one of our editors based in Pakistan, uh, and that is Professor Azim Khan. So Azim, welcome. Thanks for taking the time uh, to meet with me and to make this video. And could you start by introducing yourself? Tell us a bit about who you are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brad, for the invitation for this interviews, which are indeed a great initiative. I must appreciate that. Uh, so uh, I am basically a chemical engineer by profession. I did my uh, graduation in chemical engineering from University of Punjab in Lahore, Pakistan. And then I worked in a in a chloral clay industry in Pakistan for about a couple of years. And mm -hmm. it's a bit funny that um, I worked at a membrane plant in that industry, yeah. and I had no idea that later in my life I would be working in this with these membranes uh, at that time. And so, can you just, before you go further on, because I was fascinated to read that in your CV. So the the chlor alkali industry um, is very famous for people that work in in fuel cells because it was yeah. the original industry that commercialized um, one of the very famous cation exchange uh, membranes. So was that the kind of uh, technology they used in the plant where you worked? Indeed, indeed it was. Uh, we, I was responsible for the uh, operation and maintenance. It wasn't research related area, it was more <laughs> of the operation where we used electrolysis, membrane electrolysis for brine to produce caustic soda, hydrogen and chlorine. So it was exactly this and the same membranes. And we were using um, uh, nephron membranes, uh, if yeah. I remember well, uh, for, for electrolysis. So, um, Sorry so, to interrupt. Please, please continue no, with no, no, your, no, your, it's your fine. career. So, yeah. uh, after, my, uh, after working a couple of years, I got a chance to, I, I won a scholarship to do master's in, uh, in Sweden, in Chalmers University of Technology. It's in Gothenburg. So I did my master's in environmentally sustainable process technology. So it was more about uh, designing and working with processes that are sustainable and environmentally friendly. Uh, separation processes, but also reaction engineering and other related fields to chemical engineering as well. And I did some work with Ford Motor Company over there on catalysis, on uh, automobile, automobile exhaust catalysis. Uh, then after my master's, I got a chance to do a PhD in membrane technology in at KU Leuven. So I was working in Professor Eowen Kelicom's group, uh, yeah. and there we did some uh, very nice pioneering work in the area of high throughput uh, membrane-based gas separations. So I was involved in the design, fabrication, and application of a high throughput setup where we could test multiple. Uh, approximately 16 membranes simultaneously. So we were able to reduce the testing and application time for gas separation membranes. I also want to- Can, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that, I, I find that really fascinating. I'm sure a lot yeah. of other people would, and it's a very rare um, yeah. testing configuration to have. Indeed, indeed. So in Professor Menkelkom's group, they already had uh, done some work in the area of solvent resistant nanofiltration. So they already had high throughput facilities for liquid permeations, um, nanofiltration, ultrafiltration as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But when I joined the group, uh, we were given the task to uh, design a setup or work with a setup uh, that can be used for gaseous separation. Because gas separation, you know, it's uh, quite different when we talk about liquid separation. Absolutely. There are many uh, challenges like uh, making sure that there is a leak, uh, leak free operation in all the 16 membranes that we work with and making sure that we have the same uh, feed composition pressure because in case of gas separation concentration polarization uh, it's another uh, thing that we have to take into account so it was a different kind of challenge but we use the experience in case of liquid high throughput and we try to mimic it for gas uh, separations. Uh, and we were quite successful. Uh, we were able to test many commercial membranes because we did not want to uh, make a big claim uh, using our membranes and say that it works. So we worked with few commercial membranes and we uh, really uh, were able to justify that 
We were able to obtain same permeation and selectivity results for all the 16 membranes uh, at the same time. Yeah, the most interesting part was in case of uh, the permeation side of the, of the membrane. So we had uh, 16 wave well in the setup. So we were able to switch. So if we want to test membrane number eight, we just had to operate using a computer during an actuated <laughs> setup that uh, a certain permeation was uh, sent to the inlet of the gas chromatograph and we were able to test it. So that was a really interesting experience to first design a setup. And then in the later part of my PhD, I was involved in the synthesis of membranes. That's, so that's really fascinating. Thing. Thanks, thanks yeah. for explaining that. Yeah. yeah. So later part of my PhD, I worked with the synthesis. So we worked with mixed matrix membranes um, and that has been my forte, the forte of my research since my PhD, uh, trying different kind of polymers and, um, and nanomaterials, zeolites, and more recently MOFs. And then, uh, so my PhD was more about a high throughput experimentation and design of membranes for CO2 capture. And mm -hmm. I followed it with a postdoc in the same group. And finally, in 2012, I returned back to Pakistan and join uh, Comsets University where I'm working uh, for last nine and a half years. So and can, you, and can yeah. you tell us about this university? Is this a, a public yeah. university or a private university? How does it fit into the landscape there in Pakistan? Yeah, so Comsets University, it's a relatively new university. It's a public sector university and Comsets, the name stands for Commission for Science and Technology, for Science and Technology and Sustainable Development in South. So it's a, it's a commission that has more than, um, I believe, 20 member countries and its headquarter is in Pakistan, but it has member countries like China, South Korea, Morocco. So there are quite a few developing and some developed countries in, the, in this commission. And this university is a flagship project of this commission. So they wanted to promote science and technology and sustainable development and uh, that's how they initiated this university in uh, late 1990s, in 1996 and 97 to be precise. And uh, it has eight campuses spread in different uh, cities in Pakistan and chemical engineering is only in one campus. Uh, it's in Lahore, uh, mm -hmm. the capital of Punjab province. Otherwise, other departments like electrical engineering, you can find in five or six campuses. So our group is in, uh, chemical engineering department in Fonsets University in the Lahore campus. That's a, that's a, a a really fascinating background for a university, and to be honest, it's really reassuring to see uh, that that the governments in all kinds of countries are um, you know investing real effort, yeah. training people, and supporting research in sustainability um, because it is really not just a big topic it's the only topic everything else that we need to work on in the future is just one aspect of sustainability um, but yeah. really it, it's the core thing that should be driving everything that we do and um, yeah, um it, it is sort of multidisciplinary as well right your university it's not just a science yeah. and technology university uh, no, no, it's in fact, it's earlier, it's, it was named as Concerts Institute of Information Technology. So they mm -hmm. wanted to link whole thing with the information technology because they believe that sustainable development has to come with, uh, with, with the information technology. It has to play a big role. But then later on as electrical engineering, all the engineering departments, natural sciences, even humanities and other social yeah. sciences uh, also chipped in. So they renamed it to Concepts University because uh, information technology gave it an a, a, a impression that it's more like computer science or yeah. computer engineering focused. So right sure. now it is Concepts University and uh, nearly uh, different disciplines ranging from uh, engineering to computer sciences to natural sciences and humanities are uh, in the university. Right now. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I have to say that the, the older I get and the more I, I see how the world is developing and how we are tackling some problems and how we are not tackling others, um, I've come to really understand um, that it's not just technological solutions that we need um, to address the big challenges in sustainability. And I, I honestly believe that for many of the challenges we have in sustainability, we already have the technical solutions. 
Um, but to really solve the problems requires very, very complicated kind of teamwork or collaboration from, from a lot of different actors. Uh, the people that provide technology and implement technologies, but the people who fund it, um, the people that communicate what it's going to mean for the communities where it's going to be implemented, um, all of these teams and individuals uh, need to work together. And that's a huge and complicated problem. Uh, I, I, I think it's, it really just requires a lot of hard work and a lot of goodwill from people um, to get those teams together. It's a big challenge. Absolutely. Especially the policy makers, they play a big role. Yeah. yeah, but policy is so important because you see it everywhere. You know, when policy changes, um, it, it changes the driving forces. As, as engineers, as chemical engineers, we understand driving forces. You've yeah. talked about permeation through membranes. It's yeah. A, yeah. a natural thing for engineers and especially chemical engineers to understand driving forces. But but we see that in the way that projects happen and the way that companies invest their funds and their efforts and where they direct their uh, their people um, because it's it's all influenced by for them largely where they can make profits and those things are influenced by things like taxation regimes and trading rules um, so yes even though i have you know no no background at all in policy uh, i i truly believe that it's um, hugely influential and really important yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. Let, let's go back to to, to our um, yeah. to our journal because we're we're both um, supporting yeah. technical engineering research and design. So you've talked a lot about separations and membranes. So is this the part of the journal that you're working in the the separation section? Uh, yeah, exactly. So I'm subject editor of separation processes, uh, yeah. and I'm looking after uh, manuscripts that deal with separation processes and and predominantly membranes. I'm guessing. Uh, yes. So. Um, more than half of the of the manuscript that I receive are in the area of membrane technology, but I'm receiving also editing also manuscript in other areas of separation processes. But um, they're more or less more or less related because they are competing technologies. So as membrane researchers, we are not confined to membrane because we have to see what is happening in the competing technologies as well. Uh, so sure, that's how it's working. Very good. And and uh, you mentioned it already. And of course, I, I looked at some of your publications and your um, your background before this interview. Um, you've worked more recently with some porous materials such as metal organic frameworks. Um, so can you tell us, and, and I'm sure a lot of the people watching these videos maybe don't know what a metal organic framework is or why it's um, so interesting. So um, could you tell us a little bit about those recent directions in your work? Yes, so I have been working a lot in the area of mixed matrix membranes because generally me membranes are produced by polymers, but polymers, even though they have a lot of uh, advantages properties, but they have certain limitations. Uh, and especially when we talk about CO2 capture or gaseous separations that I've been working mostly on. So um, we have been working on mixed matrix membranes where we add porous materials like mm -hmm. zeolites, ceramics, these kind of materials to, to increase the properties of membranes. Yeah. And more recently, we have been working on these MOFs, uh, which are metal organic frameworks. And we, these MOFs are simply a combination of a metal with an organic that is linked with an organic linker to make a three-dimensional porous network. What is so interesting about these moths is that they have really extremely high surface areas. So yeah. there are some moths which have surface areas as high as 10,000 meters square in one gram per gram. So because of these very high spongy porous structures, and there are some moths which um, are, whose properties can be tailored depending on what application we uh, we are working with. So we work with a group in, in Liverpool where we modified a MOF. We use plasma functionalization to introduce CO2 filling groups in the MOFs. So we not only use the porous structure, the high adsorption capacities, high porosities of MOFs so to get high permeabilities, but also by having these tunable properties in the MOFs, we were able to have high solubilities or high interactions with the permeating molecules as well. So these are really very interesting uh, prop, uh, materials and we can prepare like theoretically there can be hundreds of different MOFs that can be prepared, but uh, there are a lot of groups working on molecular simulations. Uh, not my group, but we take inspiration from those groups who mm -hmm. really uh, work with what kind of MOF would give best permeabilities and solubilities and selectivities for given applications. 
Sometimes this kind of in silico to... design yeah. process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, so we take inspiration for, from such works and sometimes we collaborate with them. And the idea is to uh, come up with a membrane that performs uh, simultaneously high permeability and high separation as well, which is normally not the case. Usually there's it's a, a very difficult challenge, actually. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. a trade off. Yeah, it's a trade off. And we always, no matter what materials we use, we always either our students come up with very high probabilities, but the separations are very low and vice versa. So yeah. the idea is to tune the properties of these, like these materials like MOF to have both balance uh, to overcome this trade off. Super, super. I, I wonder if we could change the topic a little bit to come back to your um, international experience. So you've yes. talked about sort of a study in Pakistan, industrial work in Pakistan, then master yes. study in Sweden, PhD study yes. in Belgium. And you mentioned the, the group of Ankelecom in, in Belgium, but for our viewers who may not be aware, this is one of the very, very famous and long established membrane research groups um, in Leuven, in, in Belgium, uh, and there's other membrane uh, researchers also at that university. So it's a yeah. very, very strong center of excellence for, for membrane research um, in Belgium and in Europe uh, exactly. more generally. The center of Europe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and actually geographically, not so far away from yeah. where I am based here now in Luxembourg. Um, yeah. So we are neighbors, neighboring countries. Um, but eventually you've you've come full circle and you've returned as a professor in Pakistan. So what did you take from from those international experiences? How did they shape um, the professor that you are today? And how does that influence your teaching? Um, because as professors, we have a huge amount of impact on the world through the people that we teach. Um, and how does it influence your your research? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So. Um, when I did my master's, uh, it was in Sweden, in Scandinavia, I found there is so much of focus on sustainable development and designing chemical process that are chemically sustainable. Mm -hmm. And that was something like uh, um, we focused a lot on heat integration and process integration to make processes more energy efficient, environment friendly. And this was uh, this was something which really fascinated me because just before my master's, I had worked in industry where there was nearly no concept of energy efficient processes. Yeah. And during my master's, I got in touch with my industry where I was working. And even while staying abroad, I did help them with using some heat integration and process integration techniques to uh, kind of retrofit the process. So that was one example where I uh, really uh, took this inspiration and was able to do bring a small amount of change. And during my PhD, um, like as a PhD student, it's very really it's very different. You're not aware of the hardship your professor is going through, how they are getting the funding. So for you, it's simply research and the lab, and you feel that you have all the luxuries. So when I returned back, it was completely different. There was no facility because there was no membrane research in the university. But I, this international experience was so helpful. Uh, like uh, I contacted Professor Venkelikom and he was so kind in helping me, helping me with the training to write, how to write proposal, how to acquire mm -hmm. funding, how to um, write a good proposal that attracts the funding agencies. And thanks to all these uh, guidance that I get from this international exposure, I was able to write uh, multiple research grants and in the first couple of years obviously it was a struggle but then yeah. i was able to slowly win the grants after a few initial rejections and thanks uh, and so all this international experience helped me in getting the grants establish the uh, research lab that we have right now and even during the supervision of our hiring and supervision of masters and phd students I was able to link it with how we used to do it in Leuven, how the research group was managed and take inspiration from that experience to run uh, the research group. And uh, so far it has been quite a journey and, uh, and quite a good experience. And, and really you're, 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 a, you're a young professor, so you, you, you're, you're still relatively close to the beginning of that journey. So uh, you, you, you have a long way 
um, yet to go. What just just on the teaching side, um, how do you find the teaching, and do you try to embed this concept of sustainability in your students there? Uh, yes, um, I do. So uh, the major uh, undergrad teaching that I do in graduate uh, studies, I am teaching membrane technology. So uh, that's uh, obviously uh, something uh, that uh, related to my research. But in the undergraduate studies, I'm teaching chemical in engineering plant design. So there it's directly related to as uh, I can correlate the sustainability uh, because normally you, as students, you have multiple routes for designing a plant, designing yep. a chemical process, and then uh, you have to make a choice whether you want to go with something that is more, uh, maybe not environment friendly and sustainable, and whether you want to go with a completely different process, and then how to make this selection. So these are the things which I've been able to work around in my teaching. And I have been also teaching industrial energy systems where we uh, work with heat exchange and network designs and uh, process integration and uh, coming up with process intensification and integration. So again, something which is very close to my heart and also uh, something that I learned at Chalmers in the area of sustainability. So uh, I have been lucky in this way as well that I have been able to inculcate the concept and idea of sustainability in, in my teaching as well. And something uh, relevant to the previous question about uh, my interna international experience. So in the last few years, I have been so much linked with, with uh, some groups, uh, especially uh, uh, Professor Van Kelikom group as well. So we, uh, I have been sending students from here for a short internship as well. Fantastic. So that has been uh, a great help for the, like, because for the students here, it's very important to get the international exposure as well, yeah. uh, as they don't get to travel around uh, so much. So that really helps them a lot culturally as well and gives them exposure and it helps them make choice for their future as well, yeah. career as well. So that has been a big uh, inspiration and help for me. I'm 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 so pleased to hear that. Um, personally, as a student, many years ago when I studied, um, I was able to go and uh, do some of my undergraduate studies abroad, and then a small part of my PhD abroad, and um, it was hugely influential for me. And I'm sure that everybody says exactly the same thing. Every um, young person, as part of their studies or part of their graduate research who's able to do um, a period abroad uh, is enriched and greatly um, yeah greatly benefits from from that experience because as you said um, with what you took away from the fund Kelecom group in, in Leuven um, it's of course practical things like how equipment is set up how permeation yeah. rigs are built how they're instrumented and run but also how a lab is run um, how yeah. mentoring is done how people relate to each other and um, if you've never experienced that um, outside of your own group or your own country then you're very limited in um, in, in yeah. how then you're able it's a very to narrow approach. approach in that case yeah yeah it's, it's really wonderful. I, I, I've really enjoyed meeting you today and getting to to hear these things. Uh, I personally am a membrane researcher as well, and so I um, I appreciate. We have some connection. With I, I appreciate in more depth uh, yeah. some of the things that you've told me, especially this high throughput screening of membranes. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to say thank you so much uh, for taking the time to meet with me today, and especially to to really introduce yourself and to to share about your work and your background and your motivations, so that um, people submitting manuscripts to our journal um, know another one of the faces. In this case, uh, from the separations section uh, of someone who could be um, handling their manuscript, um, as you as you might have seen from some of the other. Uh, videos that we've made interviewing editors, yeah. we're making a conscious effort to um, to really celebrate the diversity of our journal, and that means the um, diversity of our authors, um, but also our editors. Um, and so it's it's a real pleasure to have one of our editors from Pakistan join today. Uh, and you're the first um, editor that I've interviewed from Pakistan. So thank you very much for that. Is there any parting words that you would like to share with our authors or, or on the topic of uh, chemical engineering and sustainability in general? 
Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you, Brad, for this opportunity. Uh, there's just one thing which I would like to share uh, with the authors, something that uh, I have learned as well as this position of editor. So as authors, um, uh, there is one thing which obviously it's self-explanatory, and I've seen other editors mention it, that is guide to authors. Normally, mm -hmm. uh, we as authors, we if we don't get a manuscript accepted in one journal, we simply straight away submit in the other uh, without even looking what are the because sometimes with different journals they have different formatting requirements even as minor things like line numbers or um, suggested reviewers those things and the other thing which i want to which which has really helped me uh, in the recent past once we have the manuscript ready uh, it's very important that uh, when we see the scope of the journal, if we see that it fits into chemical engineering research and design, uh, mm -hmm. I think I, I would it would just take few hours to take a break, uh, read the entire manuscript once again, and then ask yourself, do you feel confident that uh, your manuscript meets the requirements, scope, and that uh, whatever is there is required to publish a good quality manuscript in the journal? Most of the time, uh, Authors finish, uh, do a lot of work in the experimental case. They complete the experiments, write the paper, and straight away submit to the journal. And mm -hmm. it uh, wastes a lot of the, their time and uh, the time of the editors and time of the reviewers as well. So I would suggest take some time, read the uh, entire manuscript again, and uh, read it with a where, with a thought process that you are submitting in this journal and uh, whether it fits the score, whether it fits the quality, whether it fits all the requirements of the journal. And I'm I'm sure if they do it, they will be able to save a lot of their time uh, yep. in the journal as well. Yeah, very wise words. Azim, it's been a pleasure to, to meet you today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brett.